Fourier mathematics coefficients such as C1 and C2 are, as we have seen above, connected to amplitude and phase. Phase is connected to space and time. Thus the coefficients that appear in Fourier mathematics which are simple numbers that appear in front of each frequency in the Fourier formalism are actually jam-packed with information and contain how much of each frequency is in the overall signal, i.e. the amplitude of the individual frequency signal, and also what the space and time characteristics are of each frequency. None of this information is obvious, i.e. the coefficients do a marvelous job of hiding information, and it takes a lot of effort to unpack the coefficients and reveal their space-time and amplitude secrets. The Fourier process would not be able to convert frequency functions into space-time functions, and vice versa, if the space-time information could not be encoded in some way. It is encoded via the coefficients. Lawrence either theory between 1892 and 1904, Hendrik Lawrence created an electron slash either theory, in which he introduced a strict separation between matter, electrons, and either. In his model the either is completely motionless, and it won't be set in motion in the neighborhood of ponderable matter. Contrary to other electron models before, the electromagnetic field of the ether appears as a mediator between the electrons, and changes in this field can propagate not faster than the speed of light. A fundamental concept of Lorentz's theory in 1895 was the theorem of corresponding states for terms of order v slash c. This theorem states that a moving observer, relative to the ether, makes the same observations as a resting observer, after a suitable change of variables. Lawrence noticed that it was necessary to change the space-time variables when changing frames and introduced concepts like physical length contraction to explain the Michelson-Morley experiment and the mathematical concept of local time to explain the aberration of light in the Fizeau experiment. That resulted in the formulation of the so-called Lorentz transformation by Joseph Larmor and Lorentz, whereby it was noted by Larmor that the complete formulation of local time is accompanied by some sort of time dilation of moving electrons in the ether. As Lorentz later noted, he considered the time indicated by clocks resting in the ether as true time, while local time was seen by him as a heuristic working hypothesis and a mathematical artifice. Dot Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity gave the mathematics of Lorentzian electrodynamics a new non-ether context. Dot Einstein based his theory on Lorentz's earlier work. Lorentz suggested that the mechanical properties of objects changed with their constant velocity motion through an undetectable ether. Einstein demonstrated that the laws of physics remained invariant as they had with the Galilean transformation, but that light was now invariant as well. Dash Wikipedia How many people are aware that an alternative exists to Einstein's special theory of relativity, involving a radically different conception of reality? which has never been refuted. Brilliant physicists such as John Bell have preferred the alternative. Einstein's theory simply proved more popular and fashionable, and the alternative faded into obscurity where it remains to this day. Lorentz relativity versus Einstein relativity There are two versions of relativity theory. Hendrik Lorentz, after whom the Lorentz transformations are named, developed his theory before Einstein. Lorentz accepted an ether, whereas Einstein rejected it. Thus Lorentz's theory supports objective reality and an absolute reference frame for existence. Einstein's theory, by contrast, switches to subjective reality. Both theories revolve around the Lorentz transformations, yet apply drastically different interpretations of what these transformations mean. Lorentz's theory maintains objective physical reality, while Einstein's establishes subjective observer-centric reality. Length contraction in the Lorentz theory is the same for all observers, hence is observer-independent. In the Einstein theory, length contraction is not the same for all observers, hence is observer-dependent. This means that the two theories are associated with two entirely different ontologies, even though they use exactly the same mathematics. This illustrates that science is a philosophy, engaged in interpreting mathematics. Different philosophies change the interpretation. No scientist does any work regarding which philosophy is correct. Science invariably subscribes to empiricism and materialism. Einstein's implicit ontology is more accurately described as an anti-ontology. 
it is formally impossible for objective reality to be subjective, i.e. for its nature to be observer-dependent. Science, sadly, is increasingly an anti-realist undertaking. In order to preserve a philosophy of empiricism, it is willing to say that reality exists only at the point of observation, and it does not require observations to be objective, i.e. the same for everyone. The basic requirement of objective reality. No one is taught at school that science now rejects objective reality. They keep very quiet about such things. And hope no one will draw any attention to them. Sorry, guys. We're going to keep shouting about until reason prevails. The ether is the key to the different interpretations by Lawrence and Einstein. For Lawrence, the ether a preferred absolute frame exists, and everything is relative to it. For Einstein, the ether does not exist, hence there is no preferred absolute frame, which means that any reference frame can itself claim to be the ether, the preferred frame. The ether is thereby rendered subjective rather than objective. Two opposing observers can each regard themselves as being in the ether frame, with the other therefore being in a non-ether frame. Professor Herbert Dingle damningly wrote, according to the theory, if you have two exactly similar clocks, A and B, and one is moving with respect to the other, they must work at different rates. i.e. one works more slowly than the other. But the theory also requires that you cannot distinguish which clock is the moving one, it is equally true to say that A rests while B moves, and that B rests while A moves. The question therefore arises. How does one determine, consistently with the theory, which clock works the more slowly? Unless this question is answerable, the theory unavoidably requires that A works more slowly than B and B more slowly than A which it requires no superintelligence to see as impossible. Now, clearly, a theory that requires an impossibility cannot be true, and scientific integrity requires, therefore, either that the question just posed shall be answered, or else that the theory shall be acknowledged to be false. But, as I have said, more than 13 years of continuous effort have failed to produce either response. Dingle is actually making a mistake here. He's applying the thinking associated with objectivity reality to a theory that is not based on objective reality. For Einstein, it's not objective reality that counts, it's what each subjective observer sees from his own point of view.